We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Into Sheringham and so sure and funny. I will love it if we beat them. Love it. This is the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast with Gary Kearney. Hello, welcome to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. My name is Gary Kernin. Joining me for this episode is Jonathan Harding. Jonathan is a writer and author of the highly acclaimed book, Mensch, Beyond the Cones, What Sets Modern German Coaching Apart. So we started the book about two weeks ago. About one chapter into it, I really wanted to get him on the podcast. So I finished up the book, spoke to him last week. So if you haven't read the book, don't worry, I'm not going to ruin it for you. I wanted to compare German coaching to the US and the UK and then look a little bit closer at how coaches are perceived around the world. So Jonathan's insight is absolutely brilliant. You'll want to read the book after it. I highly recommend it. I flew through it. I loved it. And like I said, I'm not going to ruin it for you here. So have a listen and then pick up the book for sure. Uh, let me know what you think, as always, at Gary Kernin on Instagram, at Gary Kernin on Twitter. Before we jump into things, a quick thank you to our friends at Sports Lab 360 for putting on this podcast. If you are looking for a way to continue to guide the soccer IQ development of your players away from the pitch, definitely take a few minutes and check out their program. More at the midway point to come, including a conversation with Sports Lab 360 founder Nick Manzoni about the platform and a collaboration underway with MSC. Okay, Jonathan Harding, German coaching. Let's go. Enjoy. Jonathan, thanks so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Excited to have you on. Thanks so much for having me, Gary. We're going to talk about the book and German coaching, American coaching, a little bit of a discussion between the differences. I love the first chapter because you talk about the personal impact that a lower level coach, in all due respect, Sasha yeah. Oshendorf, and, and had on your own playing experience of amateur football over there and the tough road that he had. And I've never opened a book before where it was, I was drawn between really having a lot of respect for this person and then having a bit of sympathy for him as well. So you finish it up with talking about suffering and the German word for passion, half of the word means suffering. Do you think that attitude is embraced by the coaching culture over there? I think it's a great question. I don't know whether it's specifically German, the issue, but I think uh, people who've had to overcome some adversity on their way to coaching or whatever it is, I think there's a certain edge to them. Um, I certainly found that with Sasha, he was able to connect to far more people just because of the things that he had to go through to get to where he was. Uh, it certainly enabled him to to be able to coach better, in my opinion. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's specifically German, I think people from different countries can have different experiences that can lead them to a point of feeling comfortable because of the adversity and the challenges they've had to go through beforehand. But Sasha was great because he had to juggle so many things and he was so passionate about the game at the same time. And even if he, you know, was stuck in a traffic jam and had to worry about looking after his daughter, but was still concerned about which 15 players to take on a Saturday, he was always there and he was always giving it his best. And I think the impact that that has on a group of players, even at an amateur level, is that Hey guys, this guy is sacrificing three, four, five things. He's juggling all of this. You should be able to get yourself together, to get yourself in shape, to get yourself in the right position to be ready for a Saturday. And yeah, I mean, I think a lot of German coaches have to go through a lot. But again, I don't think that's necessarily specific to Germany. I think coaches all around the world have to go through a great number of challenges just to be able to get their opportunity, whether it be just at an amateur level or higher up. So, um, uh, but I do think it's important. I do think going through adversity and overcoming those challenges is a necessary step on the way to being successful, whatever level that is. It felt that reading the book that that you got an experience from from him and his coaching that you wouldn't have got in England at the same level or haven't received. Was it from his personal side and, and that caring that much or was it from the actual technical aspect of coaching? I found it from the personal side. I mean, I played youth football in England when I was... 13, 14, and uh, I was often, 
I remember I, you know, I, I was continually on the bench and I was never a very good player technically, but I was very passionate. I was very committed to the game and I was always turned up to training. But the, the coach at the time um, never really understood that. He was very much important or, or focused on the importance of the quality of the individual. He wasn't necessarily concerned with nurturing the human. Whereas with Sasha, I certainly felt that he was aware, okay, we can see, you know, we can see John's deficiencies here as a player, but there is something here that we can develop as a person and maybe that can have an effect on the squad and maybe he can get better as well. And Sasha would take me aside in training sessions and say, look, you know, this is what you need to do. And if you just focus on this one thing, and I remember we played a friendly once where I played three or four passes from the defence through the midfield straight to our attackers. And he said at half time, guys, we're playing a terrible game. The only guy who, who's playing well is John. He's playing these passes. He's taking risks. He's trying. He's doing something different. And that gives you a huge boost as an individual because you already know that there are four or five players on the pitch that are better than you. He recognised that. And that's why I think... Um, I have so much time for him and I appreciate for what he did for my game and which is on a minute scale. You know, but I do think this happens all around the world. And ultimately, whether you go on to be a professional or not, anybody who plays any sport at any level, you do need that level, that personal connection. Otherwise, it's so difficult to recognize your your development. Later on in the book, you talk about Klopp from a player's perspective. You know, do, do you think... In leading into the book about your perspective with a coach, do you think that it's something we should look a bit more at? Maybe not how the media portrays a certain coach, but maybe how that coach is, how life is like with that coach from a perspective of a player. Do you think we should look a bit closer at that just worldwide? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the media can do a much better job in looking at how personal interaction affects performance. Uh, I think it's massive. And I think Klopp is a great example of how charisma can change not just a player's ability, but a club's ability, a team's ability, and a community. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think supporters of Liverpool in the last two or three years will be what they are now if it were not for Klopp. Uh, I mean, I've spoken to some Liverpool fans who feel like they recognised when he arrived how absent they had been as fans before him. I mean, that is a testament to how he is able to make sure that not just the players and the team recognise that they're their, their absence, but also the community's involvement is that in that progress. I mean, that's important. And uh, I think we have had an age of analytics and I think we are approaching or we are at the beginning of an age of, of the holistic approach of, of human factors because so much of these things are not tangible. They're not something that fits on a table. They're not something that can be measured in a numerical form that you can take to your boss and say, yep, eight out of 10, 60% passing, whatever. It is. These are not things that can be measured that way. Um, you know, personality, adversity, your story, how you've come through, your emotional intelligence. These are things that can be worked on, absolutely, but they're not necessarily things that can be measured. But I think they're massive factors. And someone like Klopp has recognized that over his entire career. Coaching education, German coaching education. So something that stood out for me was you pointed out when you, when you went on your visit there, uh, to speak to one of the head guys, the, the modest classrooms that would be at home for any primary school. And I know they've got this big upgrade, I think, planned, but yep. this humble setting, I thought, you know, uh, Rasmus Ankerson has the gold mine book and it's almost takes you back from thinking that comes his facilities and the reality, like you're saying there, it's about the relationships, it's about the people. Does that perspective frame a journey of humility for a, for a German coach? Does that play any impact on their journey? I think a lot of coaches who have been educated in Hennef in, in the slightly more basic situation with those classrooms, I think that has an impact because there's nothing there that doesn't need to be there. You're stripping the environment down to the absolute bare bones and that really allows the course and the focus to be on the person and the content. And that's all it needs to be. You know, there's no extra TVs. There's no, there's no, there's no glamour. There's nothing unnecessary there. And I do think that's, that's something that they're going to have to be wary of when they transition into the big new center that they're building in Frankfurt because, you know, there is something to be said about keeping it simple. I think that's one of the reasons, you know, Bristol Dortmund's changing rooms even now look like changing rooms from, from a fifth division team. And that's because when Jurgen Klopp was there, he said, we are not changing this environment. This is a work environment. You need a place to put your boots. That's where you hang your shirt. There's nothing else that's needed here. And, you know, when you look at some of the changing rooms in, say, for example, in Syria, our teams with 
screens and personalized cubicles for individual players and i know that's the same in the premier league is that really necessary what's the added bonus there are we not just creating more of a bubble inside an already large bubble that is football and i don't think that's necessary because you start to detract from the job at hand of course i'm not a player i can't say what that feels like to be in that situation but as a person if we start to add more and more layers to something that ultimately just needs to be one basic layer I don't think that's a, a good thing. So I, I do think that's something that the German coaching academy will have to be wary of in the future because one of the reasons that it was so wonderful and one of the reasons why it works so well at the moment is because you're talking about going back to basics, back to a very basic environment where we can really focus on the content and the people at hand. And if you start to change the things around that environment or the, the course, then you're ultimately going to change it. Uh, in a, and I don't know whether that's going to happen in a positive way. It's easy to say better facilities, you know, look at the size of this building. We've, in, we've invested a billion euros or whatever it is in making it. That's all great. But naturally, it's human nature to be in an environment like that and suddenly feel, OK, well, we, you know, we're the big boys now. You know, look at this environment. Here we are. This is great. Best facilities in the world. We must be great. We've got to live up to this reputation. That affects the way that you approach your, your job at hand. If you're, in a, if you're in a simple scenario, you're looking at basic classrooms, you're focusing on the content, there is nothing to distract you there other than getting the job done and making sure that you're doing it to the highest possible standard. I, I, have, I have to say, I have some concerns about the way they're going to move forward. I hope they can retain that, that organic element. From our point of view in America, I've never looked at should we be investing? But then once it comes on the radar in the book, then I start thinking the conversations I've had with coaches over here, I'm like, well, how was this course? Some of the some of the things they talk about is the quality of the food, the TVs that they had. Then that leads me to reflect that messaging comes in different ways, doesn't it? Mm. Like messaging can be you sitting in a multi million dollar facility thinking that, wow, this is coaching, I've made it. When in reality, hunger and desire is a factor of coaching that it's not just players as well, right? Yeah, and you've got to make sure that when you bring a group of coaches together, you're obviously going to have however many, 24, 25, 30 different personalities. And you've got to make sure that you handle that as a group. But you can, you have to make sure that whatever their personality is, that none of them starts to have this sense of entitlement before they've even gotten anywhere. Ultimately, you're there to get the top level qualification or to get the next level in your qualification, your coaching degree. And you've got to know that the meals, the TV, the the extra it doesn't matter you know that's there to make you maybe feel better in the short term but ultimately you need to have a level of focus that allows you to realize guys you know we're here to understand better we're here to learn better and that's that's it there's nothing else around it and i i do worry that too much of it has become for show and not enough has become for for value really along those lines common complaint over here the price of coach education mm. is too expensive etc cetera, etc cetera. but You've you've said that uh, in your research in the book, German courses aren't cheap. They're eleven thousand. It's a tough course. What's their attitude towards? I suppose two things: pricing and value from both sides. I think the price thing is is definitely something to to talk about. Yes, it is expensive, but I think if you're talking about doing the Fußballera, which is the equivalent of your you know UEFA elite license, your top level license, I think in most cases, if you're going for that course and you're associated with a club. The club will help you in some respects. I mean, I, I don't know many coaches who haven't done that, who haven't then had the backing of clubs um, to help them get that top level qualification. Now, if you're a coach on your own and you're going through a process, you're going to have to have had some experience to be able to apply for that course in the first place. So again, you're probably likely to use your contacts to be able to help you along the way. It's not, a, it's not an easy course to fund if you're doing it all off your own back and you're a coach that's been out of, uh, out of, out of, out of a job for a while. But in my experience, most of the young coaches who are going forward and doing that, they have the support of a club um, and they're not just having to finance it themselves. So I think it is a lot, but I think a lot of them see the value in the widespread nature of the course. Um, you're not just talking about how to play 4-3-3. You're not just talking about how to play slightly more possession-based football or how to deal with you know issues in a squad. You're talking about interview situations. You're talking about psychological basis. You're talking about nutrition. There's a, such a widespread nature to the top level coaching qualification in Germany that I, I think a lot of people feel that there is a, a, a decent value in it. Um, 
the, the bigger issue is then the opportunity that comes after it. You know, you end up with, I don't know how many it is. I feel like it's something like seven, 800 people now in Germany who have that top level qualification. There's obviously not seven, 800 jobs. Um, so what do you do for an entire group of people who are technically the most qualified people for the job? Um, but I can't get the opportunity. You know, there are parts of the course that prepare them for interview situations and that give them the best possible chance there. But, you know, for some people, you can't create a personality that is symbiotic with a club out of nothing. That has to come from them themselves. So it is expensive. Um, but I do think for what you get, if you look at something like 800 hours worth of learning compared to the FA, which is a, a much smaller number in England for the amount of, of learning and the cost, um, I, don't, I feel like it, it pays itself off in some respects. But I think you could ask anybody, you know, if you want to go to college in America and study anything, it's going to set you back an enormous amount. You want to study at university in England, it's going to cost you an enormous amount. Um, I think the benefit here is that in most cases, you probably get some support from clubs that you're probably involved in anyway. That's a great point on the education side where we are, like we are moaning about it. And my school was, it's probably now up to 50, 60 grand a year. Like, right. It's amazing. But, but we would moan that something's four grand because, because we like to moan sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a sympathy for, you talked about the female coach. You do have a sympathy for this pathway is not as clear no. maybe as we would like it to be, but that seems to be the same everywhere, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that's just Germany. Mm. Um, I think it's the same in England. I think it's the same in the US. I think the major problem is the, the TV money. You know, if TV money is going to be investing billions of dollars in uh, in footage for the Premier League or the Bundesliga or La Liga, you know, you just don't get that in women's football, and that's part of the problem that that trickle down effect doesn't really you know, it doesn't help improving to improve the game. And if you don't have that financial support, it's very hard for, for a club to say, well, we've got a men's team, now we're going to set up uh, a ladies team, because in most cases, that's a financial loss. Now, personally, I think if you're a massive club or not, you have to be willing to take that loss, because what's more important is the message that you're sending to the community that you serve. And that is by saying, well, we don't just think, young boys should look up to this football club. We also think the young girls should be able to look up to this football club and say, I want to play for Manchester United, Brighton and Hove Albion, Bristol Dortmund, whatever it is. And you need to be able to say, we offer the opportunity for, for young boys and girls to be able to represent our community on the football pitch. Yes, that's a financial loss, but I think the message that you send to your community is far more important. And ultimately, in the long run, the more people that do that, it's more likely that the interest will continue to rise. And let's be honest, after the recent World Cup and the women's game, there's no doubt that we're riding the crest of a wave of of, entry, of increased in interest in a women's game. And I think that's going to continue. But we've got to keep supporting it and we've got to keep giving it its platform. And in doing so, we'll give female coaches the opportunity to get more chances to be in charge of women's teams. Because at the moment, my issue is that far too many male coaches are seeing the women's game as a stepping stone to get into the men's game. And ultimately, I can understand that. You know, you want to take your opportunity, you want to coach a team. But at the same time, why are we not giving more female coaches the opportunity to coach women's team? Because ultimately, they that for them may well be the pinnacle. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should be supporting young women who say, I really want to be the coach of Arsenal. I really want to be the coach of Bristol City. That for me would be the ultimate job. Um, and I'm sure there are a lot of male coaches who, who think this is a great job for me as well. But I think there are probably more um, female coaches who say, you know, this is absolutely where I want to be and don't treat it as a stepping stone. And ultimately, if we want to promote and increase attention on a women's game, we need to make sure that opportunity is given across the board. You know, is there a specialist courses now for female coaches? Have they moved into that there? Well, no, I think the, the great thing I think the positive is I spoke to some of the coaches and one of them is the one that I speak to in the book is that you, when you do top level, when you do football level, you do it with all of the other applicants. And I think that's probably a good thing. I don't think we need to be splitting men and women in this because ultimately we're all here to be involved in football. And a football coach is a football coach, whether you're a man or a woman. So I think the women I've spoken to have gone on this course, said that they learned a great deal from spending time with some of the male coaches uh, who have maybe already coached in a professional game, who've been in academies. There's an overlap and a chance to exchange knowledge there. 
And I think that's extremely beneficial. And I'm not sure that the diverting uh, into different courses would be would be a positive at the moment. I think there's you know great benefit uh, benefit to having this interaction between between men and women on the top coach, uh, the top level of coaching. Let's talk about the almost the modernization of the course itself. So mm. over here we've moved away from pass and fail, and I think they're doing that in some aspects in Europe as well. To touch before on the point of suffering and comfort and coaches, can we make them uncomfortable? For me, I've, I I fa- fail I failed a course, and that was a setback. Setback financially, a setback where I had to go back and repeat something, but I felt that it added a little bit of an edge to my game. Yeah, higher German coaches managing pass fail standard management. Well, I think it's tough wherever you coach if you fail. But I do think, coming back to what we were saying at the beginning of the conversation, I think there's something to be said about adversity. You know, I'm sure you can speak to that. You know, you said it gave you an edge because you're going into it with a fresh perspective, thinking, okay, I know what I did wrong last time. And I feel like sometimes it's almost like failing your driving test. You know, sometimes it can give you an edge. I think a lot of people who, some of the best drivers I know are the people who failed first and second time. And came out and said, you know what, I'm a, I'm a, I'm aware of things that I might not have been aware of had I just been given the green light the first time I did it. Everybody's different. Sometimes people can learn straight off and get it, get it right. But I think in Germany, when you do the A license, for example, you can fail and then retake uh, one time six months later. I think it's something like that. But if you fail the retakes, then you have to do the whole course again. And I think that's not an un, you know unreasonable situation talking about a high level of understanding and knowledge. If you can't prove that you've got it the second time around, how many more times do you want to be given an opportunity to prove that you know it? Um, I think at the top level, it's certainly different. I don't know very many people that will do the Fußball Lehrer that don't pass because I think it's the kind of course that if you're going to approach and you're going to apply for and you are successful in your application, it's very unlikely that you're going to fail it because the nature of the course is to nurture you, not really to fail you. I mean, people will come on that course and they'll be selected. I mean, there's a lot of applications. I talk about that process and how difficult it is to get it down to the final 24 or 25. And ultimately, when when that group is selected, you know, it's it's quite clear that this is a, a very talented, special group of people from different backgrounds and different experience in football. And ultimately, it's less because it's not so black and white. I don't think coaching at the top, top level can really be about success or failure it's more about how you approach it and frank formally talks about this in the second chapter and it's kind of something i explained because of the way he was talking to me about it there are so many ways to be successful not everybody can be jürgen klopp not everybody can run down the touchline and you know beat their chest and be passionate and that's fine you know we've got to learn that charisma can come in different forms there's different ways to be successful and that means that there are different ways to be a successful coach so when you have a group of 24 on that final fußball era course Ultimately, it's a special group, and you're looking to make sure that they understand the way that they can be the best version of themselves. And then it becomes less about success and failure because ultimately at that point, most of the knowledge that they've learned and they've learned along the way will come through their experience of the clubs that they've worked with and the previous courses that they've done. So you're entering this environment that's extremely tense and extremely pressurized, but you're ready for it. And I don't think many coaches in that situation feel uncomfortable or unready i certainly haven't spoken to any or heard of any that are not really prepared because it's not really about okay you've done that drill wrong it's all over you know you've done that drill in an unusual way why did you do it that way oh well i thought it would access the most members of the group if i approached it that way okay that's interesting have you considered that two people weren't really listening oh i didn't see it that way i was focused on just giving you see what it's more it's more about making them understand the varying ways that you can coach how many things you need to pay attention to at the absolute top level. I think it's more about that, nurturing people into the into that top level where they can then make their decisions themselves rather than saying, okay, this was wrong and that was right. You mentioned there about Frank Warmuth. Frank's the head of the, the coach education. He spoke about mir- his favorite part was mirroring. I thought this was brilliant. Can you describe it to the listeners? Yeah, so Frank um, Frank's now coaching in, in Holland. He got a job actually, uh, I think, last year after uh, I spoke to him. And um, the guy, one of the guys I speak to in the later chapters, Daniel Nikowski, he ended up taking up the new head of coaching um, at the academy. But Frank is, you know, he was there for something like 20 years. He's basically, you know, the guy 
and um, such a friendly man, very open about his ideas. And one of the things he talks about was mirroring, yeah. And I think this is very, very present in a modern game. And I think we can see it with a lot of the modern coaching appointments is this concept of what you learned as a player, what you experienced in the game before you decided to be a coach is not something that you should take forward. <clears throat> so, for example, if you as a player played in a team that played 4 4 2 and consistently played on the break, just because you were taught that way doesn't mean that you should then be a coach and just recycle that information because maybe your group that you're now coaching is different. Maybe football is not in the same space as it was when you were playing. And so there are so many things you have to pay attention to. And this is something that Frank was very wary of. He would say, look, when we get them in right at the beginning, we put them in front of a mirror and we say, look, you need to see what you are, not what you want to see. Because so often, and this is not something that's specific to coaching, but it's human nature. You know, when you look in the mirror, you sometimes think that you are something that you're not. And sometimes it takes hard truths to make you realize, actually, I'm not that person or I'm not acting this way. You know, and it's very easy to think that you are one thing, but in truth, your actions or your words will, will prove that you're actually not quite as far along as you think you are. And so for coaches in this environment, it's so, so important not just to regurgitate or to reflect, to use the mirror analogy, something that you learned or experienced when you were younger. You know, just because you grew up in one environment and this coach really made an impact on you and you had a lot of time for them and they changed your career as a player or they changed your career as a fan or whatever it is when you were experiencing football, whatever position or perspective you were coming from, doesn't mean that you could just take that and move forward and now use it yourself. Sure, you can take some elements of it and you can use it to, to impact your philosophy, but you still need to have your own philosophy and you need to still figure out what it is that you are going to bring to football that other people can't. You can't just sit there and reflect something that you learned 10, 15 years ago. And I do think that's a major issue with a lot of ex-players that come into the game now and think, I used to be a player. I know what this is about. Let's be honest. It's two different jobs. Being a player and being a coach, they are not com they're not comparable. And just because you're good at writing doesn't mean you'll be a good editor. Just because you're a good politician doesn't mean you'll be a good president. You know, the two different jobs. And I think the nature of this course is to make coaches aware of that. And mirroring is just one example. And I'll go alongside that then, the network competence, which... It's something that I think coaches cringe about because we hate to say that such and such, well, we love to say actually that such and such got the job because they know such and such. But I think that it goes a bit beyond that as well when you're talking about making the call to someone who maybe knows a player and they're being a bit more intentional in that there. Yeah, I think you have to have soft skills as well. And this is also something you have to have these personal skills. It's not just about being able to get a job. It's not just being about, you know, understanding what to say and how to approach a certain club because every club is a different philosophy and understanding how to approach that job interview. It's also about if you're out of the job for a long time, it's understanding that the people that you know will be able to open up opportunities for you. Maybe you want to go and sit in on training for a week. You want to speak to a manager that's in a job. You want to make sure that you're staying in the loop. When you're out of a job for a long period of time, that can be very difficult, can be very stressful, can be difficult in your mental state. So as a coach, when you go back in, you've got to make sure that you know that you're speaking to people say, hey, how are you? You know, Gary, I haven't spoken to you in a week. You know, you know, you, you saying Steve could say I could come by for a week and watch the training. Those are important things when it comes to speaking to agents, when it comes to speaking to players. How do you sit down? How do you work out that situation? And it's funny because, again, it's something that applies from the absolute lowest level to the absolute top. Sasha would say to me, you know, when I left one team and moved to the other, he would give the three or four players that he knew that were his guys a call and almost all of them would move across to the new team. And that is something that works on the absolute lowest level, amateur football, to the top level. Now, of course, on the top level, transfers, agents, money plays a big role and it's different. But... Ultimately, you're still talking about networking. You're still talking about being able to call the right people and say, hey, look, we know each other. We understand each other. You know what I want from you. I don't need to explain it to you. Do you want to be on this team? I'm moving here. It works for players. It works for coaches. It works for, for clubs and the philosophy. Uh, you know, I know he works in a boardroom. We've worked together before. It, it really is about learning these soft skills because a lot of the time, interaction and your personal skills are so, so important because if you're at that top level and you're already coaching in the top division, we can probably assume in most cases that the knowledge, the technical and tactical is already there. 
because it is very rare that you will get those opportunities without that technical and tactical knowledge. Very rare that you'll be able to be afforded that chance. So once you have that, it really becomes about how you are with people. Do you shake everyone's hand? Are you respectful of everyone on the ground? Do you understand that everyone plays a role in what happens on a Saturday and it's not just three people and your star striker? Everything plays a, a, a role. And I think all of this comes back to networking. It all comes back to, to understanding social skills, who to talk to, when to talk to them, and understand you just can't call someone and then leave it a year and then call them back and say, oh, we haven't spoken in a year. That's not how it works. You know, relationships are there to be continually worked on and developed. And again, that's something they practice in the coaching course. They're given situational experiences to work on and understand. Um, how do you deal with this situation? How would you work here? What happens if a club is here? And I think that's so important to practice that because you can't just be dropped in the deep end as a head coach and suddenly it's January, the transfer window is open, you need three new players, you've never been in this situation before. Well, if you've practiced it, even if it's an imaginary scenario, the advantages are endless. All right, we'll take a quick break here. Before we jump into the second part of the podcast, let's connect with Sports Lab 360 founder Nick Manzoni to learn a little bit more about his Soccer IQ platform and how he has teamed up with Modern Soccer Coach to bring coaches a brilliant new feature. Hello, Nick. How's it going? Hey, Gary. Doing well. Just uh, sat down with a fresh cup of coffee and enjoying another Premier League Sunday. Love it, love it. So, Nick, I'm sure we have people listening who use Sports Lab 360 regularly, but for those who have not yet had the privilege, can you give us a quick explanation of what it is? Yeah, absolutely. So, in the most basic sense, uh, players will use Sports Lab 360 to help develop their soccer IQ and game understanding. Uh, and the program itself is made up of individual modules, each which features a few different parts. Uh, the first part is a video that shows game film to sort of introduce the topic. The second is an interactive lesson that sort of guides players through a variety of different scenarios and challenges them to select the best option given the context of the situation. Uh, and then the third part is a quiz at the end that allows them to review. Um, so as a coach, you will also use the platform to assign you know, soccer homework to your players. And then you're also given the ability to customize the content to a certain degree um, and also track the scoring and progress of your players. So which also helps you as a coach to identify potential areas of development among your team. Great stuff, Nick. So you mentioned the piece about coaches being able to track the scoring and progress of their players, which is ultimately going to help them expose to some tactical areas of development. That said, why don't you tell our listeners about how you've teamed up with Modern Soccer Coach to take this one step further? So uh, really excited to be working with you on this, Gary. Um, the, the current way that Sports Lab 360 is set up is that when you as a coach make an assignment uh, that hits its due date, you'll receive a follow-up email that summarizes things like scoring, completion, and all that good stuff. Um, so to take that a step further, we're tapping into the expertise at MSC to offer session plans to coaches to address the modules that you've actually assigned. Um, so basically, you're a coach. You're working on switching play. You assign your team the module on switching play. When the due date hits, you'll receive a report of the scoring and completion of your players, um, but also you now receive session suggestions to address the tactical concept, of course, based on age, level, um, with appropriate progressions. So really excited to have MSC involved with this and uh, looking at this feature being available mid-January. Yeah, really excited to team up with you on it, Nick. I think creativity and problem solving are things that we talk a lot about when it comes to our players. It's something that I think as coaches we can get a lot better at. And I love this platform in terms of what it's empowering coaches to do with the tactical information and also serving players to help that tactical understanding, which is so important. So really, really excited to have another channel to do this with. So great to hear from you, Nick. And to all the listeners, please go on to sportslab360.com. Check them out. It'll take you a couple of minutes. Start up the free trial. You'll be glad you did. Sportslab360. Thanks for teaming up with us on the podcast. Back to Jonathan. Staying on those soft skills, going back to Klopp, you're right about him and Frank talking about him in terms of this. Some, I thought this was hilarious. A German under-20 player found him too positive. Mm. And I could see it, you know, and then I wondered, well, I wonder is he viewed differently in the German coaching community than he is in, of course, the worldwide lens that we see him at? I mean, I think German coaches absolutely respect him. Um they have a lot of time for his charisma and the fact that ultimately he was a player who was handed the keys before he even knew what he was doing. I think that plays a big role. He's always been a very big personality in whichever room he walks into. He's always been very funny. 
he's always been very capable of controlling the room with his humor and his, you know, he's, he's good at understanding people. And I think, and Frank's right, in many ways, he is not very German. And I think that's what sets him apart. And I think a lot of German coaches are a bit like, oh, that's an unusual way to be. And this becomes then less a conversation about nationality and more about personality, because ultimately everybody is different. Everybody has a different way to approach things or to react to certain situations. I think from a player's perspective, from, a, from an amateur player's perspective, whether you're an amateur player or not, it's the same situation. Imagine that you go to training twice a week um, and the head coach says to you, you're doing great. We love your improvement. You're doing great. And you don't play for a month. But you hear the same message every single time. I think after a while, whoever you are, however calm or however you approach that situation, you would start to ask yourself, I'm doing great, but not great enough to play. It's only logical. You're only logically going to come to that conclusion. So I can understand from a player's perspective, you'd say, wow, you know, he's so encouraging. He's so positive, but I must be missing something because he's not giving me the opportunity to prove it on the pitch. And that being said, uh, you know, I would much prefer someone who was more positive than someone who'd say, you're not quite there. You know, you're not going to play. And I can understand some people maybe want to be more direct and, you know, more upfront, but the positivity that Jurgen Klopp exudes, that idea of you're important, you are value, at some point you will contribute and eventually you do, you come on, you play a couple of games and then you realize, wow, I've been waiting six weeks for this chance and now he's given it to me. That's the thing about Klopp that I think is so important. As much as people may say he's too positive, that may well just be a sense of this isn't a very German trait because not many German people are positive or optimistic. He stands out as being different in that respect. And that's a good thing because he makes you realize that this is less about nationality and more about personality. And ultimately, wouldn't you rather have someone who was fighting your corner and telling you, that you, telling you that you were doing well and that you were developing and you were doing great, even if it didn't always give you the game time instantly, eventually it will, than rather than have someone who was saying nothing or saying something negative. I think we need more optimistic and more positive people in the world generally let alone in football. So Jurgen Klopp being, you know, too positive at times, I would take every day of the week, to be honest. <laughs> An interesting character in the book, Matthias Sammer. Like, I remember him as a player. Don't know an awful lot about him and the, and the roles that he's taken since then, but he seems to be really outspoken. He seems to have a nice blend between the old values and maybe brave modern thinking. Uh, <laughs> But he's not afraid to say it, obviously. Uh, no. What's your thoughts on him, and, and has he got a bigger role to play in Germany moving forward? I think he's one of the most important figures moving forward for Germany, absolutely. Um, he's involved indirectly with Borussia Dortmund at the moment. I think after Bayern on the treble, when he came back and was working with them, it was obvious that his absence was very much noticeable when he left Bayern Munich. He's an incredibly smart man. He really thinks about what he says. And one of the things that stood out to me when I heard him speak at the uh, coaching conference that I went to, um, one of the coaching conferences I went to where he was speaking, was this concept of flat hierarchies. And it's something that's very present in German, in the German national team at the moment with, with Joachim Löw, because ultimately, if you, have a, if you have a flat hierarchy, basically you remove all levels of management, right? And on paper, that sounds fantastic, because you have nobody in a senior position, nobody's looking down on each other, no one's superior, everyone's working together, the communication is open, everyone's putting their ideas on the table, everyone's equal. But anyone who's ever worked in basically any organization knows that the reality of that is extremely different from the practice. It's very difficult, people don't know who's in charge, so nobody takes responsibility, there's no opportunity to challenge, who's, who knows more, who's really in respect of another person, who has more experience, and that's kind of the situation I think Germany finds itself in, at least now it's changing. But immediately after Russia and beforehand, Joachim Löw was basically existing in a flat hierarchy. You had the former president of the DFB, Reinhard Grindel, who's a politician, who has absolutely no football knowledge to challenge Joachim Löw. You have his coaching staff, who's probably not up to the same level. I mean, Hansi Flick, who's now the Bayern Munich head coach, is, um, again, a very noticeable figure in terms of his absence because he was such an intelligent person. And when Germany won the World Cup in 2014, his role is not to be underestimated. He, in, in Flick, Löw had someone who could challenge him. And then you have someone you can exchange ideas with. And again, this is so important because if you take someone like Löw and you isolate the knowledge that he has, 
you're ultimately just going to do one thing, and that's to reduce the effectiveness because he's unchallenged. And so he enters Russia thinking, we're going to play the same football we played in 2014, guys. It's going to be great. We're amazing. Because no one up until that point, he's been handed a new contract. There's no one around him to challenge him. He thinks, right, as a natural reaction of being in that environment, he's untouchable. And so if you take away competent challenges of that knowledge, then you really, you know, it's devastating for any organization because people at the top need to be challenged. They need to be surrounded by people who are going to say, is this right? Maybe we consider this. And those people need to be on the same level of competency as the person in question. So Love's biggest problem at the moment is that he's isolated. And Samer talked about that. And he said, I cannot start. Don't get me started. I will not deal with flat hierarchies. You need someone who is in charge and who is absolutely at the top and who has the same level of knowledge as someone who is the head coach or the sporting director or whatever it is. There needs to be knowledge from the top down. You know, and you can criticize Bayern Munich all you want, but Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, legendary player. Uli Hoeneß, legendary player. Okay, you can have criticisms about their personality and the way that they approach things, but in terms of knowledge, in terms of how they you know, speak and interact in their business world, they understand football, they understand the coaching side of things, and they put people in position, most importantly, who are able to challenge. And Germany has suffered so much from this because Löw won the World Cup in 2014. That was the end of the cycle. That was the end of the era. Just like England won the World Cup in 2003 in the rugby uh, World Cup with Clive Woodford. That was it. All of those players, that was it. It was the end of the journey. There was no you know, new coach, new chapter, everything. You don't keep going. And it seems so odd, but it's human nature to maybe think, I can win one more. You know, so, you know, millionaires, I could be a billionaire. But how much do you need? It never ends. Actually recognizing that end of the cycle is the most important thing. And I think Germany has really suffered from that. And Sammer's absence, whether it be in the, in the DFB or the organizational structure of, of German football generally, is so noticeable. Bayern Munich is the same thing. So noticeable because he's someone who understands that. He understands that you need someone to challenge you need the, the same level of competency. Otherwise, at the end of the day, you're just going to end up with one person in the room who thinks that they're the best person ever because they've been told that by everyone else around them who's not strong enough to challenge them, whether that be on a personal basis or on a professional basis. It seems that the whole coaching community was disappointed by Love's no-show at the Coaching Congress. And, and again, that, that was something that you you really hit home that, that there was people that were annoyed by it, that the them trying to hit a, a hashtag was was almost a little bit flaky. In the US, in our conferences over here, a national team coach would never have been expected to attend. And maybe that's another issue, but is it the German culture that has created that expectation or is it the, the, the way that they presented a marketing strategy that kind of annoyed you about it? I mean, I was annoyed about the marketing strategy because it seemed to me to be a very lazy approach uh, to suggest that these values, such as determination and perseverance, were something uniquely Germany, uh, unique to Germany's dressing room or uniquely German. Let's be honest. How many teams in the world are not following these values? Are you kidding me? Do you think that any other team in the world doesn't have determination, perseverance, you know, responsibility, attitude? Do you think that Germany is the only team that's come up with this? Are you reinventing the wheel? It blew my mind that they thought they could get away with a PowerPoint presentation from 1995 with these words on it and think that this was the way that they were going to change German football's future. I thought that was incredibly arrogant. And on the Love thing, in terms of him not turning up at the, at the conference, I think this is supposed to be a safe space. It's a group of coaches who are either at the top level or approaching the top level. This is supposed to be a safe space for you to come and talk about your, fail your failures during the tournament to be able to talk about your ideas, to be able to exchange things. Why don't you feel capable of talking to your peers? This isn't a room full of media. This isn't a room full of players. It's not a room full of strangers, really. You know, we're all, at some level, working in football. Why are you not willing to set, to set yourself aside, like put yourself aside and, and say, look, you're okay, Russia was a nightmare, but I'm here. I want to talk to you. I want to understand things from your level because every single coach in that room probably had something to offer him, even if it was a tiny bit of information. And I think his lack of appearance was a bit of an insult because this is not, and, and that's not to suggest that this group of people suddenly thinks that they're so important, but Love's inability to do so, and Sam has sort of talked about this. Again, who's telling Love that this is an important thing to attend to? Probably nobody because he's unchallenged. 
again, we come back to a scenario where nobody's willing to say, hey, Jochen, maybe we should do this differently or maybe, maybe you should go to this conference because nobody wants to, because nobody's willing to challenge him. And that's so problematic. He should have been there. This was a disastrous World Cup for Germany. Take responsibility. Yeah, you need some time off. I understand that. You need some time to process it. You need some time to consider everything that's happened. But this is a safe space. This is a group of people who are all coaches, who have all gone through the badges, who all understand the difficulties. And you can't come to this space and sit down and say, yeah, I, you know, I messed up. But, you know, I just want to talk to you about it. I want to say this is what I wanted to do. We didn't get it right. You know, I'm here. We can talk about stuff. We can have an exchange of ideas because ultimately all these coaches come to these conferences because they meet people. They exchange ideas. They go away and say, I met this guy, third division team. I met this guy. He was talking about this regional training that he does. It's so interesting. Isn't that what we're all here for? To understand and exchange ideas, whatever the profession is that we do. Aren't we supposed to be getting better by talking and understanding what other people do? Not putting ourselves in the foreground and thinking that we're the best and we're unchallenged and we're untouchable. I think that was my, my biggest issue. I think in the US, it should be an absolute necessity for national team coaches to come to these conferences. Just because you coach at the national team level doesn't mean that you're better than anybody else. In fact, if anything, it opens yourself up. You say, hey, I was in the grassroots once. I started out down there. We all coached at some level. And you know what? Every level of coaching is important because it all adds up. If you coach at under 11s, you probably ended up coaching someone that went on to be you know, a professional player. And even if you didn't, you're contributing to the, the entire idea of coaching football and all of the values that come with it. And if you're a head coach of a national team, let alone someone as big as the US, to not approach these conferences and say, hey, meet fellow coaches and meet people and say, you know, just because I'm coaching the national team doesn't mean I can't exchange ideas with someone who's coaching in a regional team or a stateside team or whatever it is. That's the wrong approach. You know, you've got to be able to do that. You've got to be able to be open to a safe enough space and to be able to say, yeah, I want to interact with different people. It doesn't have to be for public consumption. You don't have to have any press there. And if they're pressed there, you let them get on with whatever you want. But this should be about exchanging ideas with other people. So in Germany, I think there was definitely a feeling from coaches that it was odd that he didn't come and he didn't because it wasn't, you know, it was a safe space. It's a group of coaches. Um, the marketing thing is a, is a separate issue for me because I think it's just an absolute disaster. I think, you know, Germany trying to be something that they're not, they're trying to market this idea, speaking in English, using business language like it's some Forbes 500 company, like stop talking about it. Stop it. Stop it. Just go back to what we're actually supposed to be doing here. And that's improving football from the youngest age all the way up. Um, and I think in the US, there's no reason for them not to do the same thing in terms of, of inviting head coaches across the board. We have to stop. Yes, management is important and a, and a hierarchical structure is important, but that doesn't mean just because you're at the top, you don't interact with other levels. You know, there are ladders. Come down, speak to people and don't consider yourself in a superior position. You may have a job with immense responsibility, but it doesn't mean that you can't speak to people who are coaching at different age groups. I think there's a, a, a worldwide necessity to view it in a different way. Mm. Yeah, it's it seems that, again, we perceive in the US, we perceive German coaching as, as absolute gold standard at the minute. And we perceive their national structure as, you know, we're used to saying that it's it's going this way. We see over here that we're doing this and everyone else is doing that. And I think some of that's natural, but it seems that, is it, I mean, there's German coaches that are now, you know, making major, major news, headline news around the world. What is it that they're doing differently than the ones domestic is it is it moving away is it a different is it branding what is it i think it's opportunity and i don't know whether that's necessarily them doing something different but i think the one of the reasons the bundesliga has been so successful over the last few years is that head coaches have began opportunities and one of the reasons for that is that the youth football in germany is totally respected and the difference between youth football and professional football in germany is minimal whereas in england for example the difference between youth football and the premier league is enormous in terms of respect, but also just in terms of structure and ability. Youth football in Germany is very well respected. The under-19s, you know, league championship game is very, very important. It's, you know, it makes news. It's not something that's just dis disregarded. Whoever wins that is important. Christian Streich, Freiburg head coach, perfect example. I think he coached over 200 games at under-19 level for Freiburg. Then he gets the job in the first team. That work at the under-19 level is respected. It's not something that to say, oh, he coached the youth level. He's never done a head coaching job, so we're not really sure about him. No, that work is respected. The only difference between youth football and first team football in Germany is the level of pressure, the level of pay, and most cases, the quality of the individual. Everything else is the same. 
the approach to training, the facilities available, the seriousness of the graft, and the importance of the results, and the importance of the development. Everything else is the same. The only difference is it's slightly higher pressure. Obviously, it's first team. It's on TV. Fine. There's a little bit more pay, and the players are probably a little bit better. Other than that, it's the same. So because everybody's aware of that, youth team football is really far more respected. You add to that uh, and a complete era of young head coaches that were given opportunities off the back of someone like Jurgen Klopp, who was ultimately a player who took the job when he really was still a player, didn't really know what he was doing. That worked out. And then everyone sort of said, oh, we can appoint young coaches, actually. It's maybe not so risky. Maybe we could appoint internally. Maybe we don't need to look outside for somebody. Then Thomas Tuchel worked at Mainz, and everyone was like, oh, ah, mm, maybe we can do this. And so you have this whole ripple effect of clubs who are saying, let's appoint internal coaches, let's educate them ourselves, we'll respect the youth team game a little bit more than we did in the past because we can see the development of the individuals. Veda Bremen said coach, internal appointment. They've already tried that two or three times. Julian Nagelsmann, he was at Hoffenheim for a long time before he was given the first team job. All of these, Christian Streich at Freiburg, all of these coaches have worked either at their clubs or at a club at youth level. That's given them the opportunity because it's respected. And then in many cases, they've gone on to be successful. If you look at the guys who've made the jump to England, Daniel Farker, he was successful at Hanover 96 youth team, got the job at Barnsley, got them promoted, right? I mean, I think it's a disgrace that they sacked him, but that's a whole other conversation. You're respecting the youth work that he's done. Um, Barnsley, uh, Norwich, uh, Daniel Stendel is the guy I'm thinking about with Hanover. But Daniel Farker is Dortmund and then Norwich. He gets them promoted there in the Premier League. Is another example of coaches who've done really well. And again, if you set your sights on just looking at what a coach has done in the first team, maybe you won't find your guy. And this is not just about how they approach their game technically or tactically. It's also about how they approach things personally. How are they as an individual? How about those soft skills? So I think German coaches have done well because that, that wave of young coaches in Germany was successful and it gave people the reason or they, they realized we can appoint young coaches. And secondly, that wave of coaches, you know, Daniel Stendhal from Hanover to Barnsley, Farker from Dortmund to Norwich, David Wagner from Dortmund to Huddersfield and now back at Schalke. This wave of coaches that went to the Premier League did well. And so people thought, ah, oh, German coaches. Combine that with winning the World Cup in 2014, which was basically the peak of blueprint German football coaching, how to play, all of this. And you've got this whole persona, this, this realization, German football Guys, there's got to be something about it. You know, there's got to be something good. And I think they've just done well in terms of timing, right place, right time, get lucky, get the right opportunities, and the right guys do well. That the, excuse me, the perception of German football coaching and German football generally has just peaked at the right time for people to say, hey, he's a German football coach. He probably knows what he's talking about. Yeah, but there is a perception of that he's a German football coach. He looks highly intelligent. <laughs> He's been successful, whereas the Eng English are now, you know, they're now struggling to get opportunities for an English coach to get a, an opportunity in the Premier League, mm. and they're not. And you mentioned the difference between youth soccer and that there, but I mean, is it is it the fact that the Germans are ultra com ultra confident in their own ability to, uh, I suppose, manage? I mean, yes, but I also, I mean, Germans are confident in in their ability to manage because of the absolutely comprehensive nature of the course that they go through but that doesn't mean that they don't get to situations where they think oh, you know am i going to get the job that's again a very personal thing and that's not necessarily a nationality thing i think the thing about england is that young english coaches are not getting opportunities there because the premier league is so fat on money that it doesn't give opportunities because what that does if you create a league that is so driven by finance is that you you reduce the amount of time in which you have to prove yourself that goes for players, that goes for coaches. So, you know, Frank Lampard was given the Chelsea job, in my very, very humble opinion, way too soon and on an emotional basis because of one decent, okay year at Derby County. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Chelsea is supposed to be one of the biggest clubs in England and you're giving the job to a guy who is, you know, was a legendary player for you guys. On what basis? Yeah, okay. Is he fully qualified? I don't think so. Has he got enough experience? Probably not. Does it feel right? Yeah, that's why we're going to give him the job. It's problematic for me. You know, it really is. Yeah. But because of that, if he doesn't do well, he's gone. 
And the, the thing we don't talk about in this, in this context is if he doesn't do well and he's fired, that affects his career. It affects where he goes. It affects his mental state. It's so difficult for him to go back to the club. Chelsea should be the pinnacle of his career. After four or five different points in his, uh, his career, you know, stations where he stayed at different clubs, after 10, 12 years of learning his trade, he should be able to go there and be like, I am the best possible version of the coach that I need to be for this job now. And it means more to me because of my connection to the club. Two, three years into his coaching career with not very much experience, he's going into this job. That doesn't seem right to me. And if you don't give people um, the opportunity to be successful in their own league, they have to go elsewhere. I don't know many English coaches that have the bravery to go abroad. I think some do. Um, I think there are some great coaches in England who are just not getting opportunities. Kevin Nicholson, one of the most qualified, one of the best coaches that I have ever spoken to in England. Unbelievable that he doesn't get an opportunity. Why? Oh, probably because his name's not Frank Lampard. Again, ridiculous situation. So many great coaches in the UK who are not getting opportunities because they're not, you know, Jurgen Klopp, Pep Guardiola, these coaches that come from, a, from abroad who have these great ideas. I don't have a problem with coaches coming from abroad. I, you know, Come on in, bring new ideas into the game. Pep Guardiola changed German football forever when he coached at Bayern Munich, and that's fine. But also don't turn a blind eye to the coaches who are in England who are very qualified, who have the soft skills, and who deserve an opportunity. For me, that's the problem. And that's why you end up with young coaches in England not necessarily getting their chances. What do they do? They coach in the second or the third lead, and you know, not very often do they get the chance to go up or do they get promoted. Um, and it's just difficult. You know, Graham Potter, who's at Brighton, great example, went abroad, uh, coached in Sweden, did a great job, looked in and said, I'm not going to get a chance here, and recognized that he could go do something special abroad. He's come the long way around, went to Swansea, came to Brighton. Now he's in the Premier League. Maybe that's the best way to go. I mean, I'm already a big advocate of going abroad and learning a different language and a different culture. Obviously, I think it's a great thing to do as a human being, but also as a football coach. But if somebody doesn't want to do that, then that's absolutely their right. And they, they can, you know, that's up to them. Um, but you, if you're not going to give coaches opportunities in England, then you can't be surprised that young coaches in England or coaches generally in England are going to be sat there thinking, well, what do I do now? In Germany, if they, you know, young coaches get opportunities. It's as simple as that. Um, and if they don't, they go abroad and they try something else. Um, that's that's it. You just have to be willing, whether you're a player or a coach. If it isn't working out here, I've got to try and make it work somewhere, even if that means I come back around to where I'm at right now. Jaden Sancho, great example. Wasn't working for him. Went abroad, made it work for him. Probably going to come back around to England in the next year or two. That's fine. He went abroad and made and made a life for himself and tried something else. Mm. Last one for you. And along those lines, how is Jesse Marsh perceived and and what? I suppose from an American standpoint, you know, you only have to look at Bob Bradley at Swansea to see like it's it's very, very difficult for that bias to move along. It's worked in Germany. Why is it work? Jesse Marsh is, uh, I mean, he had some time at Leipzig before he went to Salzburg. And I think there's, you know, probably some people who say, well, the Red Bull connection makes it easy. You know, he's gone from one to the other to the other. Um, and that takes some level of organic feel away because it's not like moving from one club in another country to another because in many respects they're owned by the same organization. Um, but it, as a coach, uh, the work he's done with, with Salzburg and especially in the Champions League this season is highly respected. I mean, in Austria, he's, he's won a lot of fans um, from the way that he's approached things. One thing that I like about Jesse Marsh is that he's taken the time to learn the language. Um, he's taken the time to understand the nuances of speaking in Germany. He's obviously not na you know, a, a native speaker, but he's taken the time to understand that it's important to not just sidestep that and assume that English is the best way to do it. You know, you are going to connect with people, especially on a team in that country, if you're able to communicate in that language. Language is totally not to be underestimated, whatever the country is that you coach in. Um, I think it was Frank who, who was talking to Joachim Löw when, they were assist when he was an assistant to Löw in Fenerbahce, and he said, Love said to him, we will not connect with these players, with the soul of these players. We will not connect with the soul of these players until we speak the language. And it's true. And, you know, I think Jesse Marsh has done a good job of, of making sure that that's not something to be neglected. Um, he's gone around and learned from as many people as possible. I don't think he, I mean, the work that he did at Leipzig, the work, you know, 
spending time with Ralf Rannick is obviously a huge benefit. Ralf Rannick is one of the leading minds of German football in the last, what, 30 years, 40 years. He's, he's a very, very smart guy. Um, he's done the right thing by going around and absorbing as many ideas as possible. I, you know, I wish him the best. He seems like a very astute guy. And uh, his connection with the language is something that I have a lot of time for because if you ignore that, uh, it's already a step in the wrong direction. Jonathan, thanks so much. This was fantastic. We've only like 10% of the book so we've covered. So I'm going to encourage everyone to go and read it. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. Really interesting just to get your perspective on writing it as well. So thank you so much for putting it out. Appreciate the opportunity, really do. Thank you. What's next? Uh -huh. What's next? Yeah. Oh well, um, I'm working on a couple of things. Uh, I haven't had any, uh, you know, second book ideas yet. Uh, quite a few people have asked me what's the next book and all of that. Um, I do think one thing that I found out doing research for this is I think that there's a lot of of work that needs to be done about personal development in football. I don't think enough is being done about that, and that's something I'm looking into. And I think that there's more work to be done. I've spent the last few months working on something around that. I think a lot of the idea and the concept of player development in football, when people talk about player development, they are only ever talking about the player. They're never really talking about the person. You know, speak to people who say player development, they're like, yeah, he needs to be better in, uh, in counter-attacking situations or his touch needs to be better. We need to work on his technical ability. Okay, but what are we doing about personal development? You know, you do also have to factor in their mental state, their emotional intelligence, their cognitive ability and their speed or, you know, their conflict resolution, or their understanding of character and their character development. Who's working on that? And in more cases than not, that's something that leads to a dead end, and there isn't an answer. And I think that's unacceptable at a professional level, um, because taking kids from the ages of 11 or 12 through an academy system, and then expecting them to be fully rounded human beings by the ages of 21, when they're playing in the first team in the Premier League, or the Bundesliga, or La Liga, or the MLS, is an unrealistic expectation. There has to be someone there to help them along the way as human beings because their career, however long it lasts, is probably not going to last longer than 10, 15 years. And the rest of their life is so much longer than that and there are so many things available to them. But if they haven't had the grounding in emotional intelligence or conflict resolution or character development, then that's troubling because what they've been sold or what they know as a result of their environment is that everything that their character is about is measured on performance, is measured on results. And that is completely wrong to me. It should be measured on who they are as a person, how they are with other people, how they interact, what their understanding of responsibility is, what their understanding of you know, determination, perseverance, kindness, empathy, um, how they deal with difficult situations, how they deal with people that they might not like or understand. Those are the things I think we need to spend more time focusing on. And if we don't do that, then I think we're neglecting our responsibility towards educating and developing young athletes. Get that out as soon as possible, please. <laughs> I'll try my best. Thanks so much to Jonathan for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There's a lot in that and there's a lot in the book. The book takes you different places. I think it takes you to looking at Germany and thinking, wow, they've got it all sorted out. And then it also then takes you to individual people who were a little bit different. But then, kind of like that interview, it also then inspires you to ask for a little bit more. And it depends, I suppose, how you perceive what that is. Some people might perceive it as jumping on Twitter and demanding that everything else improve around them. But I think, as a coach, you are responsible for making a difference, first of all, to the community. And, and the things that he said about with the German manager, Love and, and how he should have done this or how he should be doing that there. You know, if we're going to be part of a coaching culture and a coaching community, I don't think it's fair or I don't think it's right to be asking the top coaches to be doing things that we are not willing to do. And I really, really enjoyed the book, got a lot from it, but I got a lot from that conversation as well. And you can tell how passionate... Jonathan is and he does sound like a coach at times but maybe that critical lens that it takes of someone from outside looking at the coaching community you know maybe we need that every now and again whether it's from journalism or, or something else and I think that's really really healthy so I went away from that looking and thinking that maybe Germany don't have all the answers and maybe all the answers aren't so clear that we would like them to be in 140 characters or less 
and and maybe it takes a little bit more work and are we demanding enough of our colleagues are we demanding enough of ourselves and maybe it takes that attitude where we can make a difference you know we all we all want to make that difference we can make a difference with our team i get it but yeah maybe we can make a difference with those five six coaches around us and try to extend that there because you know, i do think that there is a trap where you can be a little bit too comfortable as a coach but you can also be too comfortable as a coaching community and part of that comfort is thinking that if we had x y and z we would be unbelievable and i wish we were like this other country and there's nothing wrong with going there and getting lessons from them and getting insight from them but I do think we can do an awful lot more with ourselves, with driving ourselves a little bit forward and, and holding ourselves to a little bit of a higher standard, not necessarily with systems of play, but just with quality of work and sharing and, and insights and, and stuff like that there. Is it enough to share a training session online? Is that enough to be a coach to say, well, this is what I'm contributing to the coaching community? Uh, I'm not really convinced it is. I think it was 10, 15 years ago or, or less but I don't think it is now. I think we need more studies. I think we need more coaches coming out and sharing stuff about culture, what works, what doesn't work. But that takes a level of trust that maybe that has to be built first. And maybe this is a time where you know, people are wary of, of things like social media and of perceptions and of brands. Uh, so this is, this is all new for a coaching community. But I think for us to improve the game, speaking over here in the US, I think we've got to get beyond sharing one tweet out and getting towards a little bit more detail and a little bit more depth that might sound slightly ironic coming from myself uh, talking about tweets but but that's where i hope it gets to and and hopefully we can raise the level of conversation amongst the coaching community and like jonathan said at the end once we get there uh, we need to start looking then at personal development with players. Uh, is it enough to say I care about players or do we need to put processes across and challenge them and question them, etc. I thought that was brilliant. Before you go, two things. Jump on Sports Lab 360, check it out and then go and order a copy of Jonathan's book. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks for listening as always. Let me know what you think. At Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. Have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.